humble respect to Guru Mahan, Guru Piran Sankaran, Guru Piranyo, fellow Janis. Um, the last few uh, classes we covered uh, Mahan's first principle um, of the I. And uh, today we're going to start the second important principle in the I God philosophy uh, called thought. And uh, Mahan gave a lot of, uh, you know, uh, quite a lot of uh, discussion on thought. Uh, and he has uh, spoken about how the thought plays an important role in how we shape our lives. And I want to take you through this understanding of Mahan's teachings on what he means by thought and what is a thought and why a thought is really important. And also how do we nurture thoughts that give us an enlightening and you know, awesome life. So let's start with uh, what is Mahan's um, you know, concepts on uh, you know, uh, the thoughts. But let me come back to a notion or you know, a concept that Swamiji spoke about. He spoke about um, you know, form, formless form and formless. And if you see under formless, um, you know, a lot of thoughts, ideas, conceptions are formless. And the question is that where does it come from? And how is the, the thoughts generated? And you'll see that there is a very strong link between thoughts and all our experiences in life. And here Swami speaks about the seer is greater than the seed. So before we go into thoughts, uh, there are a few questions that, you know, uh, I would like to raise, and uh, and prior to that, let's see what Mahan's uh, you know uh, concept of what thought is. He speaks about thought is a diffusion or permeation of I. I here is this substratum, you know, which is uh, you know the manifestation of this universal reality or the true reality that gives us cognition, existence, you know, consciousness. So Swamiji says that the thought is a manifestation or diffusion of this I. And what does he mean by this? And let's explore this in, in very detail because he's given a very thorough exposition of what this thought. Whenever we ask Swamiji, you know, how do we know this reality? He always says that, <clears throat> he says that, <clears throat> observe your thoughts, know your thoughts, be your thoughts. And what, is it, what does it mean by what a thought is? <clears throat> so there are many, uh, you know, uh, conception of what thoughts are. So let's explore what this is. And let's get all our, you know, definitions right. So I have a few questions that <clears throat> I want to be able to explore in this uh, concept. And what is a thought? Let's try to understand what thoughts are. We all have thoughts. We all know thoughts are very important, but let's define what a thought is. Because if you don't define the thought, then uh, if you don't define a concept, then we would not know what we are speaking about. So the first question I wanna ask is what is a thought? Why are thoughts important to all of us? Why is thoughts really important? You see, and, uh, and the third question I wanna know is that what are, how are thoughts generated? How do we create thoughts? Who creates that thought? How are the thoughts created? And the fourth aspect is that, <clears throat> which is really important is that if thoughts are generated and, and we know why thoughts are important, uh, what are the implications and what are the impact of our thoughts to our lives? Why are some people you know, having a happy life and you know, peaceful life? Others have a lot of challenges and, and you know, uh, misery and, and many of them, particularly at the present moment, you know, with COVID and a whole range of things that you see many people have a lot of challenges. Many of them are going through a lot of emotional uh, instability. So <clears throat> what is the impact of thoughts to the, you know, our state of our life, our quality of our lives? And once we understand these four questions, and this is the four questions I will take today, uh, and then I want to explore in the future uh, classes that how do we nurture, you know, 
inspirational or infinite possibilities. You know, uh, you see that many people are inspired, no matter what the challenges are, how do we nurture inspirational and thought that I can do anything? You know, um, what, what makes people, you know, what, what is the makeup of a mind that thinks in that way or transforms every thought into an inspirational thought, no matter how challenging the thoughts are? or is able to, to nurture inspirational thoughts. Also thoughts that are awesome in the sense that you feel joyful, you feel a sense of happiness. Swamiji says, Summai Rukum Sugam. You know, the joy that comes because you are in the presence of nature and the natural state of your existence. <clears throat> the third aspect is how do we, you know, transform, how do we generate universal thought? Thought may be very small, but how do we, you know, ensure that the thought transforms, reforms, and becomes a universal thought? And the last aspect is that how do we attain thoughts that are gives us that enlightening experience, what I call moksha, mukti thoughts, the thoughts that we always feel that state of blissfulness, the state of no matter what, <clears throat> not just in meditation, you know, not just in the state of deep sleep when we are very peaceful, a peaceful sleep, but how do we generate these thoughts that while living, while interacting this world, while engaging with, you know, many, many things that are, you know, um, you know, gives you an expanded, you know, uh, an exhilarating experience and also during challenging moments. So how do we nurture, <clears throat> how do Mahans and great saints and you know, people, what we call, have winsome personalities generate this inspirational, infinite possibilities, can-do attitude, this awesome, you know, this, you know, amazing, uh, you know, uh, qualities in their minds and thoughts, uh, universal mindset, and also an enlightening uh, experience. Everything they do, they say, is very enlightening. So how do we nurture this? And then, so we're going to see that in, in our next few classes in terms of satsangs and what Mahan, how Mahan shows this. <clears throat> Once we do that, then we want to ask, having thoughts is one thing. You know, having great things is fantastic. But how do we permeate these divine thoughts in all aspects of our lives? Right? So sometimes, you know, we feel this great feeling, you know, it's, you know, but how do we ensure that it is, you know, translating in our day-to-day -day experiences, our interactions with many things? So sometimes many of these concepts and ideas are very abstract, very philosophical, but how do we make it a way of life? Because if you're able to do this, then we're able to unleash the full potential of our lives, the true realities of our lives the infinite possibilities of our lives. So this is where many people find very challenging that, yes, I understand this, but I can't put it to practice. You know, I still have that knots in my mind. I still have that, that you know, things in my mind. How do I overcome those, those challenges? Right? How do I generate nurture? How, do I, how, how does my mind becomes a fertile ground for transforming, you know, all the the challenges and, and great things into combustion for my enlightenment. So, and putting it to practice, right? So, so we're gonna see how Swamiji speaks about putting this to practice. And the other important aspect is that when we put this to practice, can we see changes? Are there changes that we see in our lives? And sometimes the changes are very, very micro level. We don't observe. So how do we, in that small changes, we are able to, our senses is able to, our senses, our intellect, our mind is able to see that small micro level changes, you know, and as we go, we start seeing the transformation that is taking place in us. The DNA of our mind starts transforming from, you know, being very shrunken to a more, you know, inspirational, infinite possibilities, you know, awesomeness, 
and also that unification and that enlightened blissful. So, and, and it's trans, it translates down to the 10 capitals that I spoke about, that awareness of the spiritual capital and mental capital and so on. Ultimately, <clears throat> the final capital is the economic capital that we live in this material world. You know, we are, we are able to sustain ourselves, uh, you know, until our body is, you know, we you know, pass back our body to nature. So we're going to see how Swamiji speaks about these thoughts are really important to be able to determine the quality of the life that we live. It, live. So I want to, so I will cover the first four questions and then the remaining questions, I'll take it through the different, uh, the next satsangs. So what is a thought? So let's, let's think about, we all have thoughts. So, so what is a thought? Okay. So I, I look at a thought as a measure of experience and, and it's related to, you know, thinking and introspecting and reflecting and meditating. So here it's a measure of experience. Sometimes, you know, if you see there are many, many uh, definitions that are given to thought um, and sometimes it's very circular, but I like a simple definition of a measure of experience. It could be an experience of something material or non-material. So for example, it could be an experience of drinking a cup of tea or going for a movie, but it also could be an experience of non-material, which means that, for example, if you had a good deep sleep, the whole material world is absent, but yet you experience that absence of that materiality that in itself is an experience so we see that a thought is a measure of experience there are other more technical definitions of it you see so uh, this is a uh, by sign by a more scientific definition uh, again it says thought or thinking is a mental process which allows us allows beings like us you know uh, to model the world so we have thoughts that gives us an understanding of the world. We develop our own you know, models of the world. The world is very big, but we construct our own small way of how we understand the world. You know? And then we construct, because the world itself is infinite. The experiences are infinite. Every moment we are bombarded with so much information, but we construct this model of the world so that we have a better understanding Somewhat like a scientist, you know, uh, the world is so complex. So they develop models to be able to understand the phenomena in a more systematic way. So the mind basically does that. It's a process where it gets a lot of experiences from all the senses, uh, but it constructs a model so that the mind is able to understand the world. The construction of this model depends very much on a number of factors. And I'll go in, in a little bit more detail. It depends on how deep the mind is or how strong the intellect is or how sharp the intellect is and how you know, uh, strong and, 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 and you know, uh, the memory is in storing that information. So we see that you know, this model of the world or the universe, because it need not just be our world, but our understanding of this universe, how well that model is, or how universal that model is, or how grand that model is, depends very much on a few things that we, we do to be able to nurture that mind. So this model allows us to deal with the world and the interactions with the world in a very effective way. You know, we have goals, we have aspirations, we have desires, you know, we have, you know, various things. And we see that, you know, uh, we have this you know, objective in our lives that we want to achieve in this. So we see that thoughts enable us to you know, plan, enable us to you know, have a, a strategy to be able to achieve the things that we want in life. So we see that you know, one is a very simple definition. The other one is a more scientific definition. Whatever it is, we see that thoughts are very important for us to uh, participate in this material world and also thoughts are very important for us to not participate in this world 
So it is, you'll see that it is part and parcel of both action and inaction. So this is, you know, a simple definition of what thoughts are. And later on, I'll come back to what Swamiji's uh, perspective of thoughts are. So why are thoughts important? So, and, you know, I'm sure all of you all, you know, all of you all and all of us generate thoughts and, and we know thoughts are very important. They're important because it gives us experience, you know, experience the universe in us. You know, there's a grand universe in all of us. Um, and many of us, you know, over time, we do not focus too much on what's happening within us. We just use our mind. You know, but we don't know how the process of the mind operates. Uh, many of us are so focused on the universe around us, what happens to us, both the physical, mental, uh, you know, and also the spiritual. Although, you know, many people, you know, are spiritual. Uh, and you see that as people become more and more, uh, you know, um, mature in their knowledge, they become more and more spiritual. Um, and and most people are very material. And sometimes in that chase for the materiality, um, they forget who they are truly. So again, uh, whatever that is, uh, thoughts give us you know, an experience of this universe, both the, the in, internal and the external universe in all of us. It is also important, thoughts also are very important because as I mentioned, it gives you a model of the world. It also enables us to understand relationships, understand things that, why some things happen. So we acquire knowledge about the universe we live in, you know, and, uh, and all these thoughts, it's a measure of experience, but it's also a quantum of knowledge. It gives you a knowledge about the universe within us and external to us. And these thoughts are stored in our memories. And the reason why the memories are very important is nature has built those memory, you know, the memory bank for us to be able to access that information. So that, <clears throat> so nature is very interesting because, you know, sometimes, um, you know, as, as uh, beings, we are confronted with challenge. And uh, so nature reminds us that, you know, if you go to a particular place, you know, there is danger. So you've got to remember these things. And similarly, um, we see that memories give us, uh, stores that information for us so that later on when we want to use it, uh, we're able to access it. <clears throat> but how we manage our memory is very similar to how a library is. If we do not learn to store that information in a systematic way, in a logical way, uh, we see that, you know, accessing that information becomes more challenging. So the memory is, is very important. <clears throat> the other thing is that if we learn something superficially, and this is something very important, the process of the, the thinking and the thoughts, if a thought is not well thought of, very deeply thought of, deeply introspected, we tend to forget it. It becomes a fleeting thought. But if the thought is thought about very, very carefully, very deeply, you know, uh, using our intellect, which I'll talk about what that intellect is, we see that we're able to retain that for a longer period of time and we store that in our long-term memory. You see, interestingly, uh, a lot of thoughts that we nurture, we forget. A lot of thoughts that more deeper we store, you know. And there are many thoughts that nature itself has embedded in our memory bank. And uh, many people don't know how to access it. But the great Mahans and the saints uh, have found ways to unlock those memories that is inherent in all of, all of us. Sometimes they call it subconscious. Actually, everything is conscious. It's just that when we say subconscious, we are not aware of it. But when you learn important methods, you know, meditational methods, you know, introspective methods, one is able to unlock you know, what nature has stored in our memory bank. Which we, which we are able to use. And some of the things I'm gonna talk about is how do we unlock some of the things that are already inherent in us. So we see that, you know, it gives us experiences. It thoughts gives us experiences of both the world around us and the world within us. It helps us to acquire that knowledge of those experiences and store them in, mem in our memory bank. 
Uh, and also it helps us to build our intellect. So some of the thoughts that we store has important, rich information. And that information is what gives us that jnana or that intellect to be able to reason, to be able to look at the relationship. This piece of information has come in, information A and information B, and we see that it comes as disjoint, but the intellect has the capacity to see the relationship between them. What's the relationship with A and B? So the intellect has got the power to be able to do this. So that building that relationships, associations, the correlations, the causality, all this is part of that intellect. And that also needs to be nurtured and trained. Although it's inherent in all of us, you, you know, if you see that how, uh, when that knowledge is part of our core DNA, that how fertilization took place, how the 10th month of uh, being in, in our mother's womb, we knew how to come out, you know, these are all we say nature, but nature's embedded that you know, now the intellect in all of us. How do we then master that knowledge? So again, what nature is embedded in us and there are things that we nurture and part of the nurturing process is to understand that relationships. That is already inbuilt in us of how to build a relationship, only thing we have forgotten. But when we learn to do that, we see that we're able to build that relationship of this external world and the internal world. And this is where we start seeing our jnana starts <clears throat> coming and, and, and you know, expanding. And this is the part where Swami talks about arivin, arival, arivin, telivu. So he says that this knowledge that we get by hearsay or reading is different from the knowledge that we experience. We can hear from someone, we can read from books, but until we put it to practice, test it out, experiment it out, and then get that experience, that experience, you know, whether we validate something or not validate, whatever the relationships or things that we are looking at, only after that, that we get that experiential knowledge, ah, this works. And when we store that in our memory later on to use it, we see that we are able to build that jnana. And wisdom comes from the building of the jnana. Wisdom means to be able to understand those relationships and your role in that uh, entire cosmos. So we see that the step-by-step -step of this experience, generating thoughts, creating memories, you know, the jnana starting to look at the relationships and that too requires a fair bit of uh, knowledge to be able to bring those relationships together. And the last one is that when we do all that, it helps us make decisions in life. It helps us to say, okay, should I take this path, that path? So it helps us to both act you know, they may take decisions and also not act. So both action and inaction are part of the decision process. Because in this, you know, material world, everything is, is, is changing. And there are things that in part of the changes, we have to make decisions and our actions, you know, leads to uh, the next series of actions. And similarly, our inaction also leads to a series of things. So again, this is where it stems from a thought that gives us this experience and then the culmination of other thoughts, the follow through thoughts, the relationship between them, the acquisition of knowledge, the memories, and also the decision process. So the whole idea is to be able to function properly in this material world, uh, thoughts are very important. Thoughts are an important software that is needed for us to be able to experience this material reality. So I see this, um, this uh, we have a kind of a, a motherboard or super software called mind. Within that mind, we have, you know, the, uh, the other softwares that enable us to experience different, different things. You know, for example, you know, we have an operating system. We have Microsoft that enable us to do our word processing. We have Excel that enables us to do a lot of computational stuff. So these are the softwares that runs on an overall you know, operating system. So in the same way, and you know, our body is, our mind is, is designed in that way. And of course, we also have antiviruses. You know, the antiviruses that are, that is a you know a parallel to the antivirus. So what is our antivirus? 
it is this process of introspection, contemplation, reflection, meditation that enables us to, to leave out the things that are destructive and makes us shrunken and that which you know enhances us. So again, we see that um, there are parallels to this. So why are thoughts? So thoughts are very important and you'll see later on that the quality of our lives depends very much on our thoughts, our thought processes, and, and the type of thoughts that we generate. So how are thoughts generated? And, and this is a, a very nice article that came out in Discovery Magazine. And, and there are important links and, uh, you know, between a number of things, our sensory faculties, you know, our eyes, our ears, our nose, all those five senses. Uh, so our senses are very important. So how do we refine our senses? If our senses are, are blunt, uh, you know, our senses are not sharpened, we would not get the right information coming through. And within our brains, we have that information that is coming in as, as sound vibration through the ears or light spectrum or smell. All that, you know, stimulates you know, our neurotransmitters, our neurons and neurotransmitters, and there are electrical pulses that are generated. And these electrical pulses are then uh, interpreted as, you know, uh, experiences of taste and smell and whole range of things, and nature's embedded that. And those experiences collectively, uh, com sometimes comes individually or collectively, all faculties give us a combined experience and those experiences could be, you know, exhilarating, nice, or challenging, you know. So again, that suga dukkha experiences that we have, the duality, the continuum between, you know, uh, sukha and dukkha, you know, somewhere. And somewhere in the middle, we have some to a non, uh, and, not, and not impacted by any one of them. So these experiences, uh, you know, generates thoughts, you know, nice thoughts. And as I mentioned, you know, it's stored in our memories. Many of us, uh, you know, for example, uh, we say that our mother's curries are very nice, you know, better than all other curries or food that we eat. And I always wondered why is, uh, you know, my mother's curries taste better than, you know, um, all the other curries that I've eaten. And I realized something very interesting that uh, from young onwards, we have been eating our mother's food. And there is a trigger in our mind that remembers it and it's ingrained very deeply. And, and that's the taste that the mind is attuned to. And anything else is compared with that. And this is why the young age memories are very important. So that is why we see that the first taste that we get is, is the most profound. You know, uh, sometimes, you know, even in love, they say the first cut is the deepest, right? I think it's uh, Rod Stewart's song. <clears throat> but we see that the early childhood memories are very important. If the childhood memories are, you know, very enriching and, you know, uh, positive, you see that the child turns out very positive. And, but if the experience at a very young age has been very difficult, you see that it has an impact later on in their lives. So we see that, you know, this link between you know, sensory perceptions, you know, the neurotransmitters in our brain, the memories, the intellect, and the mind that coordinates everything and, you know, interprets all the electrical pulse into experiences, into thoughts, into memories, and into intellect. So this process is rather complex, but I'm giving you in a very simplified way why we ought to be, you know, uh, we, have, we ought to ensure that we manage our minds really well. If you see all the spiritual pursuit in every scripture, whether, you know, uh, and yoga practices, it's not about the body. It's actually about the reformation and transformation of the mind. You know, how we see the world, how we understand the world, how we understand how thoughts are generated, how we manage our thoughts, how we nurture our thoughts, and how we eventually transcend the thought process to be able to create uh, universal, uh, you know, understanding of who we are and, and generating that universal thought processes. So we see that, you know, uh, this link is very important. I want to go 
little bit more deeper. So, so we have a brain. So without the brain, we don't have that thought processes, at least you know, in this material uh, you know, world, we would not be able to cognize uh, the material world, create the thoughts that you know, are important in this material world. So within that, we have the sensory faculties I spoke about. We have memory, we have mind, and we have the intellect. And I earlier and, and key components in us. And this is why it's very important that if you want to understand, uh, you know, the the true experience of life, what is reality, one needs to ensure that the body is healthy and fit, not to abuse the body, you know, ensure that the body, you know, that is why Mahan says don't take alcohol and all these different things because it has an impact on the on the body. Uh, or drugs and you know various other things that gives you um, you know temporary stimulation. You see. We also need to look after our mind. We need to ensure that's like how the body needs healthy uh, food and nutrition and exercise and so on. In that same way, our mind too needs that. You know what's the food for the mind? We see that you know uh, uh, good interactions, divine interactions. You know. Uh, ability to generate uh, the thoughts that are, uh, you know, as I mentioned, uh, you know, inspirational, you know, awesome, you know, universal, and also um, blissful thoughts, thoughts that really understand things better and not take it for granted. And the same thing, you know, looking after your memories, you know, how do we look after our memories? When we see something, we focus, we understand it really well, and when we understand it really well, we remember it. I see. So, although we have many thoughts, how many thoughts do we process at one time, at a moment? We only process it one thought at a moment. I see. But we sometimes, before we could understand the thought, we go to the next one. And that is why we don't understand that particular thought in a very deep way. So the whole process of meditation is actually to be able to bring you down to the one optional thought so that you learn to focus and learn to make your mind like an electron microscope that any thought that comes in, it just passes through, understand the thought, decipher the knowledge before the next thought comes. So when you understand thought A, you know, really well, when thought B comes, you're able to say, ah, what is the relationship with thought A and thought B? Is there a relationship? Is there a link between the two? So you're able to piece that story better. And this is what the intellect does. So when the mind is focused, when the memory is strong, and when the intellect is sharp, you see that the dynamics gives you a better understanding of the world around you and the reality the cosmos outside and the cosmos within. And you say, hey, what I'm seeing outside is essentially not outside. It's coming from inside how I interpret uh, what I'm, you know, be the, the, the information that is coming in me. So we see this process, this key components are very important. And as I show, there are complex linkages between sensory faculties, the mind, intellect, and memory. This will be very important when we talk later on on man's uh, uh, chapter on meditation, the, the three stages of initiation. So we see this complex relationship between our sensory faculties, memories, intellect, and, and the mind. Why I'm saying this is really important is that, you know, some, we, have, we may have a garden in our, in our home, and uh, we probably, you know, spend some short moments, uh, but we see that sometimes, you know, we miss some interesting things in nature that is in our own yard. But if you take the quiet time, you know, whether it's in the morning or evening, sit down in your garden and observe the trees. You know, be one with the trees, be one with the butterfly, be one with the bee. You see that the flow of nature and the, because it is all part and parcel of nature, what you're so attuned to in a very fleeting and, and, and you know, thoughts, become more deeper and you see that the wind that is blowing the tree, the waves of that becomes part of you. The butterfly that is flying in becomes part of you. And you see that the whole nature that is around you starts you know, becoming a confluence of the nature within you. 
And this in itself is a meditation. So the next time when you're in your garden, spend a little bit more longer time observing things. And this is how you make your sensory faculties more sharper, you know, and your sensory faculties are sharper, your intellect becomes sharper, your memory becomes sharper, and the mind becomes more deeper in its understanding. So you see that there's a beautiful dynamics between, you know, all four of them. <clears throat> now, why this is really important is that this dynamics is what Swamiji talks about, that the small eye and the big eye. The big eye is part of that broader continuum of all these relationships. The small eye focuses only on small local things. But when you start observing things, this in itself is a meditational process. And the quality of that moment that you're sitting in your yard becomes so much more deeper than the fleeting moments that you've had passing by the yard the, or the garden that you have. And we see that um, as we, as our sensory, you know, as we become more and more uh, attuned to these dynamics, understand the process of how we generate the thoughts, um, how we nurture our, um, you know, our refine our senses. How do we refine our senses? This is a very important. Uh, Mahan used this word called utru trinoka noka, you know. We have to focus intensively, you know, uh, in whatever we do. As I mentioned earlier, that, you know, we process one thought at a particular time period. And we want to make sure that the thought is introspected, contemplated, reflected, and meditated upon intensively like an electron microscope. And when we do that, when we understand the thought very well, what is frivolous is put out, and what is very important, it's stored in our memory. And as we store those deeper thoughts and richer thoughts and universal thoughts, you see that it ignites our intellect to be more sharper and more attuned to this relationship between these different thoughts. And you see that our mind starts expanding. It's able to process and understand and, and give greater richness in all our experiences. So the, the effort that we put in to doing this, you know, process of, you know, introspecting, contemplating, reflecting, and meditating in everything that we do, not just in meditation. Of course, we start off in the meditation, but in everything that we do, when we drink a cup of tea, or when we have our meals, or when we have that, you know, uh, relationship with friends and family, you know, that oneness, that connectedness is really important. So that's what gives us every thought becomes a rich and nourishing thought. So this relationship is very important. And this is the part that is, uh, Swamiji talks about. Sometimes there are challenges, right? And the challenges make us go deeper. You see that, uh, you know, uh, the world has experienced uh, COVID-19. And we see that it is a major challenge for humanity. Many people have lost their lives. Many people got very sick. But what would take three to five years of a, of a vaccine, within a year, that intensity, that urgency has made the scientific community work really hard to come up with vaccines. So what was a scar or a challenge, the human mind that is really polished, you know, inspirational awesomeness, even though there are challenges, there are opportunities for learning, that, you know, universal understanding that, you know, I have that knowledge and resources to be able to address that. And finally, that blissful, enlightening experience. So somebody talks about how sufferings are the ancestors of wisdom. So most people don't want sufferings. Most people push, not that you should be seeking it, but, you know, when challenges come, you know, one needs to use that as a platform for learning. The same thing, you know, here somebody talks about how, so he's talking about how that wisdom that is a function of the thoughts that we generate, the experiences that we generate, you know, are dependent on how we manage sufferings and how tolerant we are. You know, tolerance is very important. Patience to take the time to learn, not to rush, you know, know it deeply, you know. Fortunately, we live in a ready-made world where everything, people want everything ready-made, you know. Uh, there's this rule that you have to spend about 10,000 
hours to be able to know something. It doesn't mean it's a minimum, but it doesn't mean even after putting 10,000, one will know this really well. This is a 10,000 hour rule, right? So uh, again, we see that that tolerance, the patience is very important. But the other important aspect of acquiring a rich thoughts, rich means here deep understanding of what we are experiencing, the thoughts we are generating is, you know, introspect, pondering here is introspecting research. Why is this thought here? How is the thought generated? Under what circumstances? This is actually research and the experiences. This is what Swami says, Arivin, Arivat. And we see that, that experiences are very important for this wisdom. So whatever we do, whether it's chanting a mantra or doing meditation or reading a scriptures, we ought to push towards knowing what we are doing, why we are doing, and the experience, all of this are supposed to give us an experience. Are we getting that experience that has been articulated in all the scriptures? And so if you are not, then we have to ask the question, why am I not getting it? Is there something I'm not doing right that I'm not getting it? Or maybe it doesn't work for me. I've got to try in a different way. So these are things that one, and that's what research gives us. So you see Swami says the sufferings are, sufferings, tolerance, you know, all these are efforts that we need to put in to be able to really understand, you know, our mind. So can you imagine to become a medical doctor, uh, one needs to spend about five years to do their MD, uh, MBBS, another five to six years to become a specialist. Talking about 12 to 15 years of being really good in what you do, the same thing in any other profession. But to know yourself, to know the divinity in you, how much time should you be spending? It's a lifetime journey. So here Swamiji articulates how the, the thoughts, to generate the thoughts, uh, these are some of the things that you need to do. I want to come to this very important quote, you know, which is that the secret of human power lies in the mind and the thoughts it produces, right? If you want to see the circumstances you are in, look at the state of your mind. And the mind has the power to transform anything and everything to your aspirations and what you want to achieve. The mind is a vessel that is so powerful that it's got no boundaries. A bound, boundless you know, vessel. You know, and if you see that the word kundalini, kunda means the vessel, lini is actually the power, right? And he says that the power of the human lies in the mind that produces the thoughts that are inspirational, infinite possibilities, you know, awesomeness, that summayar kumsugam, that universality and that blissful moksha feel. And I want to come to something which really fascinated me, uh, which is, I'm not sure if you know this Kintsugi, which is a Chinese, uh, sorry, a Japanese, um, you know, concept of a broken uh, bowl, you know. It is broken in, in different parts. And what they do is that they don't leave it as broken, but they join it together. And where it's broken, they join it with gold plating and and it becomes much more stronger and more beautiful. And, and this is something that is an amazing concept, which is, you'll see that across in, in, in Swamiji's teachings, he says that, Kuraya Nivirti Kuriya Kurale Kadaul. He says sometimes, you know, one who liberates and understands the challenges, you know, is attains that God realization. Another way to say is the one who is able to overcome the challenges are God incarnate. So what this Kintsugi actually shows is that, you know, in our lives, we experience many things. There are many wrinkles that we are going to go through in our journey. You know, there are many scars that we are going to experience. But if we take those scars, those experiences, and piece them together in our life journey, using the best here, goal means, you know, the best the universal, the inspirational qualities that I spoke about, you seal it, you know, the mind which has been fragmented becomes a beautiful treasure of experiences. And that's what the beauty of the human mind is. 
challenges, the scars become stars. The pressures that we, we experience in our lives, if we seal it with this universal divinity, we see that what was a pressure becomes a treasure. And the times where we are broken into pieces that we say it's impossible for us to do it through this mindset of you know introspection, contemplation, reflection, meditation, we said piecing it together and say, look, I am possible. And this is what that I got philosophy is. And you see that it draws on many of the ancient um, you know, scriptures. So, and you see that as, as we go along, I'll speak more about how do we uh, nurture this mindset? How do we you know, understand the power of the human mind to be able to generate this universal thought that gives us the full experience of this material life, the full experience of material life, you know, anchored on our full experience of our spiritual reality. So with that, thank you very much. Sandosham.